This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. We've received a letter from Batman this morning. Please inform the citizens of Gotham that Gotham City has earned the rest from crime. But if the forces of evil should rise again to cast a shadow on the heart of the city, call me. Question. How do we call He gave us a signal. Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Bat Fans. Yes, we're still here. This is episode 181. My name is Tim. I'll be the host for this episode. And joining me, as always, is Dane. And Dane, I'm watching some history right now. <laughs> You're watching history? Baseball history, I should say. Oh, really? Why is that? The first ever Major League Baseball game is being played in London right now between the Yankees and the Red Sox. A what? historic moment for the game. Why would it have to be those two teams? I mean, I guess it would have to, right? I was going to say, it has to be those two teams. Yeah, it <laughs> could, to be be the like, could be like the Orioles versus the, <laughs> the Brewers, right? <laughs> well, the Brewers are having a good season. I was thinking maybe like the Orioles and the Royals, kind of the two oh, worst okay. teams in the, <laughs> in the American League, if those were the showcase ones. <laughs> what happened to the, to, to, uh, the Royals? Yeah, I think. Well, most of their good players from their championship run have went elsewhere. And mm. yeah, the rebuilding has already started from them again. But <laughs> yeah, sorry for the Kansas City fans out there. But hey, you got a championship, so <laughs> it was worth it. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not so sure the A's could afford to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe much. baseball wouldn't pay for their trip. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think. I think the A's would have to pay for that. Oh, they would probably sad. have to. They probably would have had to take a boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! The it other teams have... there for like a whole week, and they're still waiting for Oakland to get over there <laughs> by boat. Oh, yeah, sorry. And, and it's not flying to the East Coast and then getting on a boat. It's getting on a boat from the the Oakland San Francisco Bay. <laughs> and they go around South America. <laughs> oh man! Imagine going through that as a baseball player. Yeah, uh, traveling to London by boat. <laughs> like, say, so you know what? Maybe I'll I will go to college. Maybe I will go to law school <laughs> <laughs> instead of that's, playing baseball. That's I forget his name. That's why that player they drafted chose the NFL. Overgoing, oh, uh, Kyler, over. <laughs> Kyler Murray. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it. I don't know. Maybe it was different for the A's. You know, when they did draft him or leading up to the draft. But you know, just as a fan, I could already tell he was going to the NFL. Oh, just right away. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then he wins the Heisman. The yeah, Heisman. Oh, I think that just sealed it. Yeah, and he was like, oh, "Okay, I'm going to be like a." At least, though, either the first through the third pick of the NFL draft, or whatever. Mm. Ah, just bad decision. <laughs> bad decision on the A's part. Yeah, now they they just wasted our high pick draft pick that year. Yeah, and um, you know, we were talking about the NBA Finals last last uh, episode. Uh -huh. Um. So yeah, the, I I guess this was the last season that. 
the Golden State Warriors were going to be in Oakland. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so they're moving across the bay to San Francisco. So even if they do uh, make it to the NBA Finals or the playoffs or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, no more seeing the, the the Coliseum right next to Oracle Arena. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be such a you know missing element for those you know commercial breaks where they pan out and show the outside yeah. of the arena. You could see the beautiful Oakley Coliseum <laughs> <laughs> right there. What they call the gray toilet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, accurate in a lot of ways. <laughs> oh, this stadium they're playing in in London. It's mm. definitely wasn't made for baseball, so they had to bring everything over, like the dirt, turf, and just make it a baseball field. But the dimensions oh. on it are kind of crazy you thought oakland's foul territory was huge this the, the stadium where they're playing right now it's even bigger than oakland's foul territory so yeah <laughs> pitchers are gonna get a lot of fly ball out if the players six they're hitting it into the stand that it's not well you figure it's probably made for soccer right probably i i would yeah. imagine so <laughs> yeah so how, how do i mean i'm just wondering how that works i mean did they build the stadium to host baseball or no? They're, they're, no, they didn't build it specifically for baseball. But right. They're just I mean, having to use the stadium for it, which is why they brought all the everything they needed for the field over. No. Uh, What's a little cool aspect? Looks. What's that? I wonder how that looks. It's not the prettiest looking field, <laughs> but you know, it still looks like a field. Better than Oakland. <laughs> oh, you don't Sorry, have to do dude. that much. <laughs> you don't have to do that much. Yeah. It's kind of cool, though. It's like the up. first time ever the Yankees and Red Sox are playing each other, and they're both wearing their home uniforms. Hold on. I'm just taking a look at the stadium. Ah, okay. Yeah. And there's a like a catwalk. You know how Tampa's notorious for their catwalk yeah. fly balls. Oh, yeah. That. What is that? <laughs> the same thing. There's one that's lower than what's in Tampa, uh, which hasn't come into play yet, but I imagine it might at some point. Looks like, looks like everybody's sitting in the outfield. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the London fans weren't getting a great display of pitching that MLB has to offer because both the Red Sox and Yankee starting pitcher – Gave up six runs each in their first wow. innings. It yeah, didn't make yeah. it out. <laughs> Look at the box score right now. Yeah, six six, and then now it's eight six in the third. Yeah, I mean that <laughs> inning, that first <laughs> inning took literally an hour to complete. Wow, really? Yeah, it was pretty long. <laughs> it was all. Hopefully, the London fans liked offense because that's what they got in that first inning. Oh, well, at least they get to see some baseball. Exactly. So hope, the hope is, of course, why Major League Baseball is doing this, is that baseball becomes popular in London and hopefully, you know, just expand the game more globally. Maybe they'll get their own league someday over there, just like Japan has their own league. Who knows? Yeah, because I know um, the NFL and the NBA go over there every year, right? Do they? I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. yeah I think so. So I know it's only. I, uh, they're going to want this to be more of a, I don't know if it's going to be annually for the next few years but next year they're already have the next teams and dates settled it's going to be the cardinals and cubs going to london next year oh good uh classic teams is not <laughs> not the 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 rays versus the i don't know <laughs> tr- it's obviously they're trying to showcase the game's best rivalries <laughs> so maybe the year yeah. after that be dodgers and giants <laughs> hmm. yeah probably yeah, but, yeah, it's a cool thing. But, so, what about the A's? Well, they can go to Japan like they usually do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> make, make that long trip. Yeah, they don't have to go around the continent to, <laughs> in a boat to get to England. They just gotta <laughs> fly, fly on an airplane. They made that trip already this year, so yeah, I guess they had their international voyage for well, hopefully for a few years because. I'm sure it might wear on a team if they have to make several trips across or over to different countries. It's like a few years in a row that would probably yeah. be exhausting. So I imagine they won't be going on any international trips for a few years at the least. Are the Mariners still owned by Nintendo? I don't think so. Well, they yeah. they sold their um, 
their stake? I believe so. If anything, uh, maybe they have a little stake in it, but not as much as it used to. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, but they still have their displays <laughs> out on the field or like little really? advertisement displays they have. Like behind the Nintendo, the Nintendo logo. Yeah, or just like advertising the Switch or new games, something like that. So. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> or maybe not now because I haven't seen too many games in Seattle, but this year, but they were the stadium was bought out by T-Mobile, so maybe it's just all T-Mobile <laughs> advertisements now across the field. So it's T-Mobile Arena. It's T-Mobile Field, I believe. Oh, uh, T-Mobile Field. <laughs> Which I hate it when these baseball stadiums, their names get changed like to corporate advertisement yeah. names, like t-mobile target field in minnesota mm. it just takes a little away from the specialness and uniqueness you can kind of get with things like you know wrigley field fenway park yankee stadium I, I i do like stadium names that showcase the team's name on there too like dodger stadium yankee stadium marlin stadium yeah <laughs> well i think there is i think it's called marlin's park actually if i yeah marlin's park yeah. uh ray stadium uh, no, no. Tropicana no. Field. <laughs> Tropicana. <laughs> oh, here's, a, here's a question. What do you prefer? The term like stadium, field, or park? Park. I could see that. It's a, it fits because yeah. you're going to, you know, outdoors playing in a park. So I, I, I just don't like, um, you know, arena. Or yeah, stadium. I agree. You know what I mean? I like stadium because it can have sometimes have like grand feel and scale to it, like Yankee Stadium yeah. does. So that's appropriate for that. But I like, would agree, park is probably like, the next uh, best one. Yeah, it would have to be something else like Coliseum, right? Mm. The Oakland Coliseum. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I I think I would prefer park, field, Coliseum, something different, not mm. just not just McDonald's Stadium. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's coming at some point, but oh, yeah, <laughs> this is a matter of time who makes a deal with them. No, Burger John. King Coliseum, yeah. um, <laughs> Jack of the Box Park, <laughs> Jack of the Box Park. You know what? Just change all the baseball fields and stadiums to fast food restaurant chains. I mean, <laughs> it'll be easier to remember. <laughs> Taco Bell Field, yeah. <laughs> The Wiener Schnitzel Arena. Yeah. <laughs> See, some of them have nice rings to it, I, I, I will have to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I I assume they have enough money to name a stadium. Yeah, I would think easily. Yeah. <laughs> they could work out a deal with some team. But, but I wonder if, like, I wonder who has a city and what company can put their name on the stadium. Is it, I mean... Well, maybe Is that's like a rule or like that's a, probably part of the agreement they work out. You know, we'll go in with you, we'll give you the money for a new stadium, but you got to make sure like our name gets top billing on the name of the field or whatever. I'm sure that's all worked out in the contract details. Yeah, but what if like the top bidder or whatever, or top investor is something, somebody from a company that's unsavory? Let's say, <laughs> you know? Well, then maybe they'll have to work out something else yeah, <laughs> with yeah. someone else or change the name a bit. I don't know. But maybe that's Oakland's ticket to getting a new stadium, going in with a fast food chain. Oh and, yeah, that's that's smart. I, mean, uh, I think they'll take that. A new stadium, even if it is named McDonald's Field or Taco Bell yeah. Park. <laughs> I think they'll make that trade regardless of what it's called, just get a new stadium. Yeah, Wendy's <laughs> um, Coliseum, the, the the Wendy's Coliseum. Yeah, that, good. that doesn't sound too bad. The Kentucky Fried Chicken Coliseum. <laughs> well, Wendy's might be good because they could sell Frosties at the ballpark. That would be nice. Oh yeah, that would hot day have a Frosty. <laughs> and if you want, you need some chili. Yeah. <laughs> chili and Frosties. There's a winning combination. <laughs> yeah, straight to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, at least the plumbing will work in the new ballpark this time. <laughs> yeah, the, the plumbing, I assume, would work. Correctly. <laughs> you got to throw in the assume part. <laughs> I, I, I think I told you one time I was watching a, um, an A's game. They're playing at the Coliseum, and uh, the broadcasters threw it over to uh, Dallas Braden, who does like 
you know, he's yeah. he's the on the field guy for uh, the NBC. Uh, I forget what the uh, I forget what the the the, the station is, um, but. So they throw it over to him, and he's on camera, and he's talking. But, like, over his shoulder, you can see, like, exposed wiring. Like, just exposed <laughs> wiring going to, like, a light or something. And it's like, I mean, come on, guys. I, that... I don't think they have this at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> Is that a code violation? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that has to be. I don't think they have this at even the oldest baseball <laughs> fields in America. I don't think they have this at Fenway. I don't think they have this at um, Wrigley. Wrigley. I don't think, you know, even the oldest, the oldest, oldest baseball stadium. I don't think they have exposed wiring sticking <laughs> out near the field. Like, wow. I, I can't believe that. <laughs> yeah, only the Coliseum. Yeah. <laughs> Sad to say. <laughs> But I guess Oakland would take that trip to London just to get a few games out of, away <laughs> from playing the Coliseum. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think it's a cool thing baseball is doing. So it was cool to see some early games. And then tomorrow's game is going to be like at 7 a.m. Pacific time. So I don't know if I'll be up that early to watch it, but <laughs> it's been fun to check out. You know where the MLB should go? Uh, they should go to India. Because I've, cricket cricket is really big in India. Is it? Yeah. So cricket is kind of like baseball. Yeah. So Yeah, I'm sure baseball would love to go anywhere that, you know, they can showcase the game and make it more popular and expose it. So maybe that will be on the docket somewhere down the line. Yeah. But I guess with that that's our discussion on well, we usually have baseball topic discussions throughout the course of a year when <laughs> we do these episodes, but this is probably the first one we'd ever did that had to deal with fast food chains and <laughs> <laughs> renaming baseball stadiums by them. So uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe we called a future ballpark name and we just don't know it yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> but with that, we can go ahead and get into our dark Knight rises minute by minute commentary. We are going from minute one twenty nine to a minute 30. So we're hitting another milestone here. Another 10 minutes gone by. So we're on the two hour. We're going to get to the two hour and 10 minute mark. So we're getting closer to that two hour and 40 minute runtime here. So <laughs> 30 minutes to go <laughs> or 30 episodes, I should say. <laughs> but as always, you can get your relevant media format like your VHS tape, like your Betamax tape, your laser disc, your HD DVD disc, your Blu-ray disc. You know what? Pretty soon, 4K is going to be on there with all this 8K talk. Yeah, with all the 8K, which I haven't even really fully gotten into 4K. I got a few movies, but right. now I'm thinking, do I really want to make that full conversion <laughs> to 4K of the next ones right down the line? So probably not. I mean, yeah, <laughs> y- you already have to throw away your 4K DVDs, your 4K TV to get an 8K, right? Yeah. So, so. I mean, when new movies come out. I'll get the 4K version, but like when probably the only exception will be Star Wars <laughs> when that gets released in 4K or Lord of the Rings once those come out, like, like rebuys, like not doing too many rebuys of movies I already have on Blu ray just yet. So that might be the wise course of action to take. But also can't forget your Netflix physical media, your Blockbuster video membership card, and the greatest media format ever to be created <laughs> your VHS to DVD converter. The only Gotta, way. The, the only, only way to get way. the version's director's intended. <laughs> so with that, I will give the countdown. Are you ready, Dane? Yes, I am. Three, two, one, play. As Batman is still talking to John Blake here. And we're getting close to the big action scene. But we've got a little bit to go. And then yeah, finally... And another foreshadowing of Batman possibly dying, <laughs> where John Blake <laughs> says thanks, and he goes, don't thank me yet, and he goes, well, I might not get another chance to later. I love the shot where it's just snowing. I mean, we get that later in the daytime, but this shot of Batman and Catwoman walking in the night with the snow falling. Little Batman returns us there. And this is all fake snow, right? I think so. I know at least they the big fight, there was some of it. Yeah. It was fake, 
Well, I love the Batman's face right there when Selena just starts the engine when he's trying to explain it. his head goes down like, oh, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and we're going to get to, are we going to make it out of it? Nope. Nope. The minute and the Batman and Selena still talking, but <laughs> we're getting to the big final confrontation, which I'm excited about. Should be a lot of exciting minutes going forward. In our I'm next surprised episodes. that um, that little thing where he uh, uh, Batman stores his uh, bad pod. Uh, I, I'm surprised that wasn't broken into. <laughs> hey, even if it's a little storage bunker, you know it's gonna have the best security in the world. Oh yeah, <laughs> Bruce yeah. is gonna have it well covered. <laughs> So that's our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary for this episode. And going from the last solo live action Batman movie to the first in our featured topic for this episode. Yeah, we had a big milestone in the Batman fandom last Sunday on June 23rd because that was the 30th anniversary of the 1989 Batman movie, which is hard to believe and (laughs) hard to think about, really. And everyone was tweeting about it. And I will say I jumped the gun a few days earlier on my personal Twitter account and the Batfans Twitter account about the 30th anniversary because I was seeing some tweets about it on Thursday, uh, what was it, June 20th, saying, you know, people saying, oh, 30th anniversary for Batman 1989 coming out on this day. I'm like, okay, I guess that's it's the release date. I don't remember the exact date, but I saw a lot of tweets about it, even from official sources like, you know, the DC Universe app tweeting about the 30th anniversary. And before I sent the tweet, I, I usually check just to make sure. I did a Google search, Batman 1989, said, you know, release date, June 20th. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so I sent some tweets out. Then it was brought to my attention that, no, that's actually the date the movie premiered, not the official release date. So, but still in the same ballpark, <laughs> regardless, tough to get a little bit. But yeah, so the 30th anniversary of Batman 1989. And I wanted to do something a little different for our discussion on it because we've had episodes in the past where we talked about the movie and just last year when I got to see it in the movie theater for the first time, that was kind of our look back at what it was like experiencing the movie for the first time, seeing it, how, what our reactions was, how we saw it, what it was like back then. So we did that on that episode. That was episode 153. So if anyone wants to hear more discussions like that about the movie, you can check out our episode 153 to get more conversations that we had uh, talking about Batman 89 and what our experiences were seeing it for the first time. But didn't want to just do a retread of that for its 30th anniversary. So I uh, figured do something different. Um, this one is going to be kind of a list of our favorite things to come out of Batman 89. Things that introduced from the movie that became staples in the Batman franchise and in fandom. Or even things that it brought to us just as fans. That not necessarily in the movie, but... Um, stuff that's important to us as Batman fans, and it's lasted for 30 years now. So um, that's what this feature topic is going to be uh, for this episode and celebrating Batman's 30th anniversary, some of our favorite things to come out of the movie. So um, as always, I like to do top fives. <laughs> so I got five things I'm going to list as far as my favorite things to come out of Batman 89. I'm not sure how many you have, Dane, but I always like to stick with five. So uh, okay. Can I do one thing that I wish was, um, or that kept on going? Of course. Uh, Bob. Uh, poor Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish, like, I mean, seriously, I wish Bob, like, you know, was in the comics and, you know, Joker had a, you know, Bob in Dark Knight, you know, <laughs> so, like, or a Bob-esque character, you know. Yeah, that's... I'm I'm wondering now. Maybe it's an issue we've missed, but I'm at least ones I read and can't remember of Bob the Goon being, you know, an Easter egg henchman or for the Joker in any story. I can't remember that being a little Easter egg of the character being thrown in somewhere. I'm surprised yeah, it hasn't I'm, been though. <laughs> Thirty years. Yeah, I'm, uh, like I was trying to think. Like, like when I saw what our featured topic was, I was like, I was trying to think. Like, was Bob ever a part of the comics? And I don't think so. I think you're right, but part of me thinks no, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there has to be uh, a writer out there who appreciated the greatness uh, of Bob the Goon, <laughs> Joker's number one, as he likes to say. <laughs> I did have the Bob the Goon uh, toy, so I was a supporter of Bob. <laughs> uh, the, the the animated movies? No, no, not that I remember. No, 
Yeah. Okay. Man, we got to change that. We got to get the hashtag going. Bring Bob the goon back, <laughs> or <laughs> bring Bob the goon into <laughs> continuity. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess my first one would would be Bob. Yeah. That, that, that's what I wish. Uh, I wish uh, would be in the comics or something. Even if it's not a wish, it's something you're thankful for that came out of Batman '89. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Bob, so. <laughs> I mean, it did make from one of the more classic moments of the movie. Right. <laughs> where Joker sadly shoots him. Yeah, <laughs> Bob God, I just love how Bob being you know, you know the loyal you know henchman of the Joker you know just doing it no problem being the good soldier that he is gives him the gun and the, he just gets shot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and even, even the Joker, even um, even the long gun, uh, you know that he shoots down the the bat wing with. Yeah, <laughs> like, like I don't think I've seen that. I mean, it was it was funny. But I don't think I've seen that in the comics. I wish you would have a long gun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see that one. I, for some reason, I I like the thing has been referenced somewhere in the comic. Some I can't remember exactly, but mm. you know all the gags and stuff that Joker could sometimes do. That one had to be referenced somewhere at some point. Yeah, right, right. But yeah, if anyone knows, let us know <laughs> if Bob's ever showed up or that long gun. But I have a feeling that long gun. Has a better shot of Bob being referenced than any Batman comics, but but for me, I guess my number uh, five choice going from five to one um, is gonna be something that I've made no secret that I love that came out of the movie, the Batmobile. I mean, the greatest looking Batmobile ever, in my opinion. And there's been a lot since then that have come since Batman '89, both in live action and in the comics, TV shows, whatnot, but. I don't think anything's going to top that Batmobile. I mean, yeah, even the animated series ones, even though it took inspiration from that design, it's not quite as cool looking as that Batmobile that was in Batman 89. And uh, that is definitely one of the best things to come out of that movie. It's iconic. It's so recognizable. And talk about something that has been used as Easter eggs in comics <laughs> quite a few times is that Batmobile. Whenever, you know, sometimes an artist is showcasing a cool wide shot of the bat cave and they throw in these easter eggs the Batmobile, the 89 batmobile is always usually in there in in some shape or form and for good reason it's just so cool looking i remember seeing it for the first time because before then my only batmobile that i truly recognized and like was the 66 one and that's an iconic one too but once that batmobile I saw in motion for the first time. I can't remember exactly where I saw it first, if it was in an image or the trading cards I got in the trailers. I want to say the trailers, but just because a lot of times in the trailers, it was heavily featured in those early trailers and TV spots, showing it go through uh, the chemical factory and blowing it up. Just remember thinking, oh man, that's just the coolest thing ever to see it <laughs> drive around with its firepower, its bombs and all the equipment and gadgets it has it just looks so cool and it made for one of the coolest sequences in the movies of the chase from batman and joker's henchmen just seeing it drive down the streets of gotham uh i just will never get tired of looking at it and just uh, watching that scene and seeing what that batmobile can do both visually and just all the amazing cool aspects of it and one of the best things back in 2014 when i was fortunate enough to visit that um, Batman display at the Warner Brothers uh, Studios tour where they had that Batman exhibit and they had all the Batmobiles on display. Guess which was the first one I went to? The Batman 1989 Batmobile, which is so cool to see it in person. The only thing I wish I could have gotten the driver's seat <laughs> and sat in it for a little bit, but it was awesome. And kind of a cool culmination of being a fan of that Batmobile for so long. So, yeah, my number five is definitely the Batmobile from Batman 89. It will never be topped, in my opinion. It's just that classic, and I'll be forever thankful for the movie introducing that iconic look for a Batmobile. Did you see that article? Um, it must have been like a month ago or so, but apparently there's a Batmobile in the forest of in the forests of I, I want to say Kentucky. Mm, yeah, that I haven't seen an article like that. No. Out there. Yeah, no one knows how it got out there. Really? Or why it's out there. What Batmobile yeah, is it? It's an 89 Batmobile. It is, okay. Yeah, it's it's just out there. Like I guess somebody found it and posted it. And 
you know, somebody wrote an article about it. Nobody knows why it's out there. Wow. No one tried to take it. <laughs> so yeah. Get it back. Well, I mean, I doubt you can get the thing started. It's been I mean, he's like to try to tow it or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just saw that. Um, speaking of cars for movies, you know, I was driving home Wednesday, Thursday, this past week. Um, and you would not believe what I saw, Tim. Not a Batmobile. Not, <laughs> not a Batmobile. But it's from another movie we both love. Another franchise we both love, Tim. Hmm. A Jurassic Park Jeep. I, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like it, the full, uh, the green and yellow colored one, like the one they take on the tour, or the one that they enter the park in where they see the, uh, the, the red brachiosaurus for the first time. Yeah, the, the 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 red one that the, that first one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It had Virginia license plates on it for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but I I do know you, you you can take a tour. You can go on a tour where they filmed Jurassic Park, right? Uh huh. And there are the jeeps there, but I've never seen one on the road. <laughs> so. I have. That had to be cool to see. Was it just did it look like someone driving it was just you know a person taking it out for a stroll in casual clothes, or did it look like a worker who was on those tours or something? It, it looked like tourists. Okay, but then I was wondering what, why did it have Virginia license plates on it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, like like the the jeep was filled up. I mean, it was like four people, five people in the jeep, and I was they they looked like tourists, and I was like, you know what? What's how, how did you get this here? <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, I, that'd be cool to see though, just on the road. <laughs> yeah, I tried to take a picture of it, but it, I, I was driving and it came out all blurry and stuff. So uh, I know I was gonna say that would have been cool if you got a nice picture of it because yeah. I would like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for me, yeah, it's the it's the Batmobile. Um, for me, that'll always be the perfect Batmobile. It, even though, you know, I mean, you can't really look at the Schumacher ones, but the the Tumblr, yeah, that's great. Uh, the Bat Pod, yeah, that's great. Um, the the Ben Affleck one, yeah, sure, that looks nice. But for me, it'll always be the, the 89 Batmobile. I guess just nostalgia. Um, that That was the first one like you were alluding to that I thought was the coolest, coolest thing I've ever seen in a, in a movie up to that point, you know? So yeah, for me, it's the, the 89 Batmobile. Yeah. I'm not even I, a... I, I always love when I read a comic and the artist or the, the creative team, you know, kind of shot, shout, shouts it out. You know, yep. <laughs> they, like, they they pay homage to it. <laughs> yeah, seeing it on the page will never cease to give me or not to give me a smile whenever I right. see it. <laughs> it's always <laughs> awesome. I was gonna say too, I'm not even a a big car guy. Like I'm not into cars really yeah. at all. But that one, it just you know, it just spoke to me in a way that no car ever has or probably ever will, as far as how cool it is. So yeah, it'll always be special. Yeah. So going into my number four pick. This one might be a little different or a little out there, but I'm thankful regardless. And it is the Batman NES, not the game, even though it is a fun game, pretty hard, but the soundtrack for the Batman NES game. And anyone who's listened to previous shows knows how much I love that soundtrack, and particularly the very first track, Gotham City Streets or Streets of Gotham, the first level of the game. That, to me, is as in like well maybe not quite as iconic as the batman main thing which we'll get to in a bit but it is one of the most iconic pieces of batman music in my opinion it is that good i just love that music so much and that it's associated with batman to me it doesn't get enough recognition <laughs> as far as how good it is sure it has to do with those and growing up during that era and playing the game really appreciating it but i think anyone who listens to it and just is a fan of video game music or even if the 8-bit style isn't your thing, there's been some great remixes of it and just how great of a tune it is. One in particular is by a group called The Advantage. They do cover the video game songs and they do a great rendition of it. 
it's just so so good i mean one of my favorite pieces of video game music and just batman music and just music in general i love it so much and i wouldn't have gotten it if they didn't decided to you know license out the video game for batman 89 and get that awesome piece of music so it was almost kind of a you know a surprise byproduct <laughs> of just trying to cash in on how popular the movie was and you know the brand of batman during that time and getting that game was really i was looking forward to it so much just to be able to play a batman game for the first time on you know just anywhere really because there was a batman pc game based off the movie which i saw out of someone's house that i went to one time who had it didn't really play it too much but that batman 89 game was the first time i got to play batman in a video game and it was really fun but out of everything the graphics being able to play as batman the gadget you got to use in the game Nothing stood out to me as much as the music <laughs> of that first level. Nothing has. So I always got to give, you know, just the game's props, but the movie props for allowing that game to be made and for getting that awesome piece of Batman music. So I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you have not checked out the theme song for, or the theme song for the first level of the Batman game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, do yourself a favor and search on it on YouTube and check it out. And again, if 8-Bit style midi music is not your thing look up uh, the advantage you know gotham city streets or streets of gotham it kind of goes back and forth on the name of it but you won't be disappointed it's just so good uh, for me my next one is going to be that sort of iconic uh first scene with batman you know the mm -hmm. um you know where you drop the, the two guys or are talking about well, like this Batman guy, yeah, and then he slowly drops down from the, from I guess a higher roof, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, and each Batman movie after that has that iconic scene. You see it in Batman Begins, you know, at the docks, mm -hmm. and you see it in Dark Knight in that parking structure mm -hmm. um so yeah like that iconic first um reveal of what batman looks like what he is that sort of thing yeah that's a great call because that established you know how important of and such a great moment you look forward to in a batman movie seeing batman show up for the first time in whatever new movie you're watching with him in it's always such a great feeling when you know you know batman's coming you're gonna get a first look at Batman in this movie and it was first established perfectly in Batman 1989 and set the standard for you know how to introduce Batman in such a cool way and show why he is you know so many people's favorite superhero and is why he's so such a great character and yeah that's a good debate to have as far as which one did it the best between because I think the choices are between uh Batman Begins and that doc scene and Batman 89 just showing you know the type of character batman is and how he fights crime and they're going to do it in different ways but both of them are so so effective and how they went about it and they're just you know you can't deny the how iconic that opening scene is in batman 89 when he takes out those two muggers and you know ends it with the classic i'm batman line just all of yeah. it's so perfect so I'm, I'm just wondering why you know thinking about it why he um you know sort of puffed out his cape <laughs> you know when he's coming down he's going for the theatrics i mean different yeah, movie yeah, but okay. you know what uh uh ducard said to him in batman began you know going for the theatricality oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> still a great shot though i mean i don't yeah. care the reason but just seeing yeah, yeah. <laughs> just he, he doesn't he doesn't need a reason <laughs> yeah the only thing i really don't like about that scene is seeing him get shot i mean of course he allows himself to get shot because they have that body armor but I always prefer, you know, Batman being able to, you know, just be so quick reflexes that he's able to dodge the bullet or get out of the way fast instead of just, you know, standing there allowing to get shot because of the uh, armor he has on. So just one little nitpick about that scene. Get shot twice in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, with the plate, that, that silver plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, three times. Because then when uh, him and Vicky Vale are escaping the Joker, he shoots, he has her take the grapple and he falls down. And then he gets shot there. Too right. Well. right. So, <laughs> good thing he, he has shot that. Armor. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so my third pick, as you know, I alluded to it, talking about the NES game soundtrack, and it is going to be the main soundtrack or the main Batman theme for Batman 89. I mean, you cannot describe the music and the theme anything less than iconic, memorable. I mean, there's so many words you could use for it, but man, talk about the perfect theme that captures the essence of not only just this version of Batman, you know, being the first time we're seeing the dark version of the character on screen, but just it's such a perfect theme that it can fit for any version of Batman. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, except the ones that are maybe more lighter tone, like the Adam West series or Brave and the Bold, but for anything that's doing a more darker series, Batman, this theme by Danny Elfman it just goes any could fit any version of Batman. Obviously, they used it for Batman the Animated Series early early on in some of those episodes, and then it, Batman had his own unique theme that was a variation of the Danny Elfman theme that Shirley Walker did, but I always loved it when certain episodes, especially earlier on, like one episode that comes to mind is The Last Laugh, where Batman is going after the Joker into that garbage incinerator facility and he's going on the conveyor belt and they play the full iconic Danny Elfman, Danny Elfman Batman theme from the movie. I always loved that <laughs> just every time I got to hear it in the animated series. And yeah, just perfect. And I was excited when... You know, Danny Elfman decided he was going to use it in Justice League for Batman. Um, I It was used sparingly, and, you know, the rest of the soundtrack, there's nothing to write home about <laughs> for Justice League. But hearing those classic themes, you know, not only for J- John Williams' theme for Superman in the movie, but for Batman, it still fits. Again, going back to my point, no matter what Batman you're using, it could be applicable to a lot of different versions of it, because that's not... It still worked well for Ben Affleck's Batman in the scenes that was used in Justice League. So it's so universal. It just fits the character so perfectly. Every time you think of a music theme for Batman, you would think of the Danny Elfman one first. And not to knock what Hans Zimmer did for Batman Begins in the Dark Knight. He had an impossible task to try to follow up an iconic theme like Danny Elfman's. And I think we talked about this in the in the previous episodes as well, but he did as good as a job as you can to create something totally different from it, but still have it feel like a Batman theme as well. But still, in my opinion, you cannot top what was established in Batman 89 in that theme. And just that whole intro for the movie, I just love it so much. It's something that when you're first watching it, you don't know what you're looking at. You know, what what is this? We're seeing the title screen, but are we in the Bat Cave? And what are we looking at here? And then it forms the Bat the Bat symbol, which is just awesome. And the way the music swells up to that epic conclusion, and the symbol just kind of moves forwards and fades to black before the movie starts. It's just awesome. And just hearing that theme for the first time in that opening credit sequence, that's where it hits you right away. You know you're hearing something special in this music, and are in for something special for the rest of the movie that's going to follow it. So it's just a great piece of music. It fits the character and it sets the tone for the movie as well, knowing you're going to be getting something special here. So that Batman theme that Danny Elfman created will always be the high standard for me as far as, you know, a music theme associated with Batman and was introduced right here in Batman 89. It really is his, his, um, iconic, uh, Danny Elfman's like iconic soundtrack, right? I would think is, so. Is, is there anything else that he's it's that 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 he's done? I don't Spider-Man? think not. <laughs> no, maybe Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I do like that soundtrack. But, but I I guess <laughs> I don't know about full well full soundtrack. No, but I think a theme that is probably up there would be The Simpsons. Oh right, yeah, yeah. You're probably probably correct on that one. But this soundtrack is his John Williams soundtrack, right? Yeah, it's a it, great it, soundtrack. It, it is it is his John Williams moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in terms of being iconic, you know, J- John Williams has Jurassic Park, he has Jaws, he has Star Wars, Indiana he has Jones. Indi- <laughs> Indiana Jones. So, yeah. Um, my my pick is also the soundtrack. Um, the Prince one is also very good. I would say I, I will say it's also very good. I've yet to listen to that full Prince soundtrack. 
I think I think I said this before how I was getting anything Batman related during that time and, and parents got me the Prince tape. <laughs> I think it was if I remember right, it was like a yellow coloring with the bat logo on there. But yeah. I, I remember them having to take it back because of the lyrics. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that I guess a six year old couldn't what yeah. should be listening to at the time, and I never really <laughs> went back to it. So <laughs> Not sure how inappropriate it was, but apparently enough to where my parents didn't want me listening to it at the time. <laughs> Surprised, on a way, you, you you didn't see it when it came out, right? No, yeah, I yeah. was aware it was there, but was not allowed yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> what about Returns? That one I did see. Oh, okay. It was fun. That one kind of had an embarrassing moment too, or or what? I was gonna go see it for the first time. I think I had like a panic attack or something. <laughs> I was really? like either too excited or just nervous about seeing the movie or whatever that I had to leave before it even started. I had to see it at a later time. So I didn't get to see it. When, uh, I was going to see it with, you know, my two brothers, some cousins, so, but I missed out. And they all came up telling me, oh, you missed a great Batman movie, Tim. It was awesome. Like, <laughs> I guess I was just too, too excited. That, <laughs> too bad you had that panic attack. I know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I still don't know to this day what came over me because I was obviously so excited for Batman Returns. I was finally going to be able to see a new Batman movie in the theater for the first time. Maybe I guess all that build up from not being able to see 89 in the theater, the Batman Returns was kind of up in the air. <laughs> and then I, I was finally allowed to. But yeah. maybe all that excitement was just built up and I couldn't handle it. I remember one time. Um, now, now you see, I, I can't remember who the baseball player was. It was a pitcher, is all I remember. But I, I think for the Brewers um, or the Padres or somebody. Um, but I don't know if you remember, but like back in like the the late mid to late nineties, the uh, I guess through either sponsor, sponsorship um, or something these baseball players would tour around during the off season through Sears. Okay. Man, yeah, I don't remember so, that. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> so like they, they would tour around and do autograph sessions and stuff. And I remember being so excited leading up to that because my parents had told me, Oh, you know, so-and-so is coming down and uh, he's going to sign autographs and meet people and take pictures with people and stuff. And we're going to go. So I remember getting all excited, like so, so excited. And so like the day of, we're standing in line and I start feeling sick. I remember no, no. really feeling sick. <laughs> like, uh, I'm going to throw up. And, <laughs> and like, I'm feeling sick. And then, you know, we get to the front, front of the line and, you know, wh whoever that picture was or whatever signs the autograph, we take a picture and, you know, that's done. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, in, in the mall, like, I I just have to sit down. So we go into a McDonald's, and then I throw up in the McDonald's. I just oh, throw up a lot. <laughs> I had not in the bathroom or the no, dining area. Just the, the um, where you stand in line. Just throw up. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure a lot of people lost their appetites. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the flu. <laughs> that was the first day of the flu. Ah, <laughs> uh, Dave. <laughs> I'm sorry. You had that horrible experience. <laughs> but you don't remember who the player was? I do not remember. <laughs> um, you were too sick. I asked my parents, like, do you have still have the picture? Do you still have the autograph? And, they're like, oh, we can try and look for it. And they just never got back to me. So apparently it wasn't that big. I mean, it wasn't like a Roger Clemens, right? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would have remembered. It wasn't like a, you know, whoever, right? So, like, yeah. it must have been somebody that wasn't, that had a good career, but wasn't that big, you know? So, yeah, to, to this day, I have no idea. <laughs> well. <laughs> They should at least try to look for it just for that reason alone, just so you can remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't a total waste. <laughs> and I remember seeing the, the picture, that's why. The the picture with the autograph on it, but uh, I just can't remember who the picture was. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't get him sick, too. <laughs> 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 All right, so my number two pick, and you might be surprised this isn't number one, but 
You'll find out why when I get to my number one choice. But my number two favorite thing to come out of Batman 89 is Batman the Animated Series. Of course, this had to be in my top five. It cannot be a top five without it. But um, it's funny because usually you associate, at least I do, Batman the Animated Series with Batman Returns because they both came out that same year. But this series got the green light and, you know, was a decision made by Warner Brothers and during because of the success of Batman 1989. I mean, it was in production probably around the same time as Batman Returns and got the green light probably around the same time as Batman Returns got the green light. But the fact that, you know, the Batman 89 was such a success, there was Batman fever all around the country. Everyone was excited about Batman again. It just made sense for them to, you know, want to capitalize on that and get an animated series going. And you could think that it would just been a you know quick cash grab. Let's get a cheap series made just to tie in with it and sell toys and all that stuff. But the fact that Warner Brothers decided, you know, to make their own animation studio in house again and give the care that this series deserves. And yeah, again, for all that stuff, you got to watch that documentary that was on the Batman animated series, Blu-ray box set. I said, when I reviewed the set, what a great surprise that documentary was and what I always wanted to see in regards to Batman, the animated series, it goes into great detail, how that show came about, but we wouldn't have got it without Batman 89 being the success that it was. And just giving us this new take on Batman and kind of paving the way for more takes on, you know, a darker, uh, more serious versions of Batman to be played out on screen. And that's a big thing for Batman, the animated series. That's what makes it so great. It wasn't a show just made specifically for kids and it was light tone and, you know, played down to the audience. It was something that obviously adult fans loved at the time. Um, uh, kids who watched it like me as adults now still love it and appreciate it for the seriousness and the adult themes and stories that it showed. Um, it was able to do that, I think, because of, you know, the success of Batman 89 being a darker version of Batman and allowing that to be done on other mediums as well. So, um, I mean, I've talked about so much why I love the animated series, so I won't go into detail on that and all the reasons why I love it. Anyone who's listened to the show now after 181 episodes <laughs> knows how I feel about it. But I just never really given the credit too much to Batman 89 when talking about it. Like I said, it's usually always associated with Returns because it came out during the same time. There were heavily, the designs were a lot taken from Batman Returns when it came to the Penguin and Catwoman specifically. So it isn't more associated with that, but we wouldn't have gotten it without Batman 89 and the success that it had was showing a darker Batman. And I, there's another reason to be forever grateful <laughs> for Batman 89 for giving me my favorite version of the character ever. So um, got to give it more props for that, which I probably haven't done um, over the course of me podcasting about Batman. So I got to start doing that more and appreciating Batman 89 paving the way for Batman, the animated series. Yeah, my next choice is going to be um, uh, kind of tied into yours with the with the animated series because I'm not sure where I saw it first mm -hmm. and what made more of an impression on me. Um, and it's something simple that you're looking at throughout the entire movie, even if Batman isn't in the scene, is the design of Gotham, that uh, Art Deco mm -hmm. style. Yeah, that had the biggest impression on me with the yeah with the art, the art deco style like the the gothic buildings the towering buildings the shadows and all that stuff um but like i said i'm not sure if the animated series made more of an impression on me if returns did or if it is 89 so yeah, kind of unsure on that, but it did start in, you know, of course, the Batman 89 mm. uh, movie. So, yeah, that's my choice. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, it just feels like Gotham from the opening shot where you right. see, it says Gotham City. You just know you're not seeing any other city <laughs> that you recognize in the U.S. So it, they just did a great job of capturing what Gotham is supposed to look and feel like. So totally agree with you there. Good call on that one. And it, it has it's, taken it's, other... Iterations obviously have taken from their design of Gotham as well. So it has been something that has been replicated um, yeah. in other Batman iterations, which was cool to see too. It's kind of my minor, minor, minor nitpick of the 
um, Nolan movies, especially Dark Knight, Dark Knight mm-hmm. Rises, where they just don't really have a feel in it. You know, yeah, it, it, it could be Gotham, it could be Chicago, it it could be New York, it could be Pittsburgh. You know, it, it just it looks like really, yeah, a typical city. Yeah, it looks like every city USA. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So, and Gotham's supposed to be more than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, it, but but like I said, it's just a minor thing. Of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool choice on that one. But for me, my number one pick that came out of Batman 89 has to deal with me personally. And that is, it gave me my hardcore Batman fandom that is still alive and kicking as strong as ever today. I mean, I was a fan of Batman before the movie. I always like to say like I do with Star Wars I was kind of bored born a Batman fan because I don't remember that exact moment <laughs> where I first saw the character and became a fan of his but I probably couldn't say I was a hardcore Batman fan until Batman 89 I mean I owe it to that movie in that time frame of when it came out for making me fall in love with the character like never before and becoming that hardcore fan because even though I was not allowed <laughs> to see the movie when it came out in 1989, I was totally engrossed and immersed with the hype and the fandom going around with it during that time. I mean, this is the era where I, st- I first watched the Adam West series because I remember, can't remember how far or close they were syndicating it and re airing it when the movie came out. It might have been, you know, early 89, late 1988 when they were rebroadcasting it. And that's where I first saw it and became a fan. And getting into comics as well during that time. That's where I pretty much got my first comic series. And you heard me talk about this series to death on the show. The Untold Legends of the Batman. It was around the same time they reissued those with those audio cassettes that told that story. And I read and listened to those to death. (laughs) I mean, that's where I got the basis of my Batman knowledge as a young fan (laughs) was through those comics. And then just, you know, then getting excited for the movie, seeing the trailers, collecting the trading cards, the TV spots. Um, my my dad's like saving newspaper articles and showing me newspaper articles about the movie. I guess that was his way of maybe trying to get me exposed to it because I wasn't allowed to see it, <laughs> showing me what he could. But just that period, like 1988, 1989, of being excited for the Batman, for the movie, and how it led to these other iterations of Batman of me getting exposed to and making me a hardcore fan and just falling in love with with the character because of these different exposures I was getting to him outside of 89, but it was all because of the first Batman movie. It all stemmed from that and my excitement for that. And then that trickling down to me looking at other avenues to, you know, kind of wet my appetite, or I should say, you know, fill me up with something else because I wasn't able to see the movie. I had to get my Batman fix elsewhere. And that led to me becoming a hardcore Batman fan for, you know, for the rest of my life. So because of Batman 89 coming out when it did, it allowed me to get exposed to so many other great Batman stories and just my knowledge of Batman growing and getting familiar with his backstory, the villains, other characters that, you know, his supporting cast, this all came from that time period surrounding the movie. And I owe Batman 89 everything as far as why uh, I became such a fan of the character during that time period so yeah my hardcore batman fandom being established when batman 1989 came out has to be my number one pick because you know that's the most important thing (laughs) still remaining the love you have for a character that you've been a fan of since as long as you can remember but the time period when you really became that hardcore fan (laughs) that will always stick with me that was some of the most fun memories I have as a little kid and just being a Batman fan, uh, ex- being exposing, being exposed to all that stuff for the very first time was something I'll never forget. So um, that's the thing I'll always be forever grateful for and the most thankful for uh, to come out of Batman 89. Yep. Same thing, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my, that's my number one for all the reasons why you said um, it made um, 89 and Batman Returns made me a Batman fan, and I haven't stopped being one. Um, and yeah, that that it it totally changed my life, 
I, I, I can honestly say that about Batman 89. I know for you, it's like five different movies, Tim. Five different <laughs> franchises. Well, um, it's really just, you know, at that time, especially the Star Wars and then Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, that's my number one. Yeah, I mean, as also, too, like, no matter if there's a bad stories or bad movies that come out, you know, it's not going to affect your love of the character or the passion you have for the franchise of Batman, because, you know, it could just be, be done. It will be done in a better way at some time down the line too. So it's just something that our love for the character has been established for so long that you could, you know, withstand the lows that sometimes come, comes with the highs of being a fan <laughs> when they right. put out uh, either new movies or new content for it. So, but I mean, we've had some plenty of highs with Batman in movies in the last 10 years, especially with the Nolan trilogy, but I would say the high, the highest of the highs was The Dark Knight and Batman 1989. And see, again, it's kind of hard for me to say not, you know, being able to see it when it first came out. But I do think if I had to choose which era or which year had the biggest hype around surrounding Batman, whether it's 2008 with The Dark Knight or 1989 with Batman, I still think Batman 89 has the edge. Maybe it's just, you know, being a young kid and everything seemed so like bigger than life at the time. You just could not escape that hype surrounding Batman 89. I think it was everywhere, no matter where you turn on the TV, it was on the news, was talking about the newspapers. Like I said, people just talking about it. I remember you know, at school, all the kids were, you know, buzzing about it. It was just everywhere you turned, it seemed like. And maybe it's because, you know, of course, in 2008, there was a lot more, you know, different franchises around that time that Bat- the Dark Knight didn't have the main focus and captured the attention of, you know, the mainstream media at the time, even though it was huge. And once it did come out, you know, it was everywhere. But I just don't think the lead up to it was quite as strong as it was for 89. And, you know, I don't want to <laughs> sound like, you know, there was take anything away from the Dark Knight and the hype surrounding for it, because there definitely was. But from what I remember... It just didn't quite reach that level of 89. It's probably the closest uh, any other Batman film has gotten since. But I just think it's a peak level for Batman fandom that won't be reached again. And it's, you know, not a knock that any other movie might not because it's it was the first. It's always hard to recapture, you know, the first time something, you know, just encompasses, you know, is a zeitgeist type thing in culture that, you know, just encompasses. That's kind of hard to describe again because <laughs> i'm trying to remembering it from just you know watching it from her front and not actually being you know in, in the theater at that time with people but i just do remember it being everywhere being a time for batman fans like never before so um it would be great if some like the next movie by matt reeves and robert pattinson has that you know surrounding it but you shouldn't expect it for that movie as well so it was just a special time to be a Batman fan in 1989 and being able to experience the fandom of Batman, like just reaching out far beyond fandom, I should say, into the mainstream and just people everywhere having bat fever, <laughs> as it was described back then, and I think was pretty accurate. So, yeah, just a special time during that era. And I'm thankful that, you know, even though I was a young kid <laughs> being exposed to it, I, you know, still think I was. Uh, a good age for it even though i wasn't allowed to see the movie that's <laughs> just being around i was six years old during that time and just like i said being exposed to batman and his characters his history his story like never before during that time period just making my anticipation to see that movie stronger and stronger was because of that it, it just always have fond memories of that time period so yeah Happy 30th anniversary for Batman. Um, it's hard to believe it is that old, <laughs> which means we're older, <laughs> which we don't like to admit. But um, it's a movie that still holds up to this day. It is a movie of its time. You could tell, you know, it is a movie from the 80s. But still, it has that look to it that also makes it timeless as well, I think. And that goes into what you're talking about with the design for Gotham City. So it'll always be a Batman movie and story that'll be worth revisiting no matter how old it gets. So yeah, happy 30th Batman. It's a well-deserved, you know, you have a well, the, the I should say the respect that movie has and what it's done for 
the Batman franchise, comic book movies in general is just well deserved because it was something that we've never seen before during that time and it was special. So yeah, kind of rambled on there for a little bit and <laughs> try to say get across of how special Batman 1989 is and celebrating its 30th anniversary. But that was a fun discussion talking about the stuff we love about it and why that movie is so special to us and all the great things that came out of Batman 89 that are now staples in, you know, the Batman franchise and just into our fandom just being fans of the character. So, yeah, it was a fun one. Okay, so Batman 89, Tim, or... Oh, no, here we go. <laughs> the the first Star Wars movie you saw. Well, see, I don't remember seeing Star Wars for the first time. <laughs> That's one of those things where it was just always there. So I don't know if I can, that could be a fair comparison. You got to go with Star Wars, I think. Yeah, I think as far as I think you're talking about the impact that in 1977 or just me seeing it for the first time. Uh, you seeing it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I can't. Well, yeah, I, I guess you do have to say Star Wars because that is my, you know, number one <laughs> fandom and franchise that I love. But as far as how I felt after seeing it for the first time, I can't say like I do remember how I felt after seeing Batman 89. Besides saying, finally, <laughs> it was just, you know, everything I would hope it would be. It just left me with a great feeling afterwards. So I do remember that, but I can't say well I felt about Star Wars, even though I know it obviously had a big impact me, on me as well. So I'm not letting you win this one day with that hard choice. <laughs> <laughs> I tr- try to get my way out of it. <laughs> and I think right. I did okay at doing that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you did all right. Um explaining why you think star wars is better than batman i <laughs> see you again you're trying to make it more <laughs> choosing one over the other. <laughs> i won't allow it <laughs> so yeah that's our future topic for this episode on our way to celebrate the 30th anniversary of batman next time we'll be celebrating a 30th anniversary for a batman movie we'll be in 2022 it's gonna be a oh, big Tim. one because it... uh so speaking of batman 89 and um I guess Tim Burton. Um, I realized something, or I saw I saw a fact that sort of blew my mind. Did you know that Tim Burton didn't direct Nightmare Before Christmas? He didn't, but he's no. credited as a director, right? <laughs> no, he's he's a uh, um, he wrote the story and he produced it. Really, I was. Yeah, he didn't direct direct it. it. Who directed it then? Anyone we know? Um, Hold on, let me look it up real quick. Yeah, because isn't it even the title, Tim Burton's A Nightmare Before Christmas? Yeah, somebody named Henry Selleck directed Hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure that is well known by a lot of fans of the movie and just i guess movie fans in general but <laughs> for us i guess that comes yeah, as a surprise so. did not know that me neither because yeah, it's obviously always associated with tim burton but yeah yes yeah, so well i guess we're, we're the ones who were left in the dark <laughs> <laughs> anyway sorry no, no i was just gonna say no, 2022 is gonna be some big anniversaries because 30th anniversary for returns and batman the animated series i mean you know that's gonna be a big episode <laughs> oh yeah especially for someone. Yes. Yeah. We'll see if I can. Maybe I'll get to talk to Bruce Tim again. And I'll make him cry again for 30. <laughs> just like I did for 20. <laughs> did, did you also interview. Uh, uh, what's her name? The the voice cast director. Yeah. Andrea uh, Romano. Yeah, Andrea Romano. You, yeah. you interviewed her on that red carpet thing. Yeah. I did a few times. I think I actually spoke to her three times. Oh, wow. Yeah. So which was always great. I mean, she's always friendly answering your questions and enthusiasm and just yeah. really make you feel like your questions are validated and important to her. So she, she was great. And again, just an honor just to even talk to her oh, once, let alone three times. So it was, she was great. That's good. Yeah. I miss doing those. I haven't done those in a while, but <laughs> I'm not sure the reason why, but <laughs> I don't know if we're just not getting invited anymore, but I don't know, <laughs> but I'm just thankful <laughs> I got to do those few ones that I did back in 2012 and 2013 because that's where I got to meet some of my heroes like Bruce Tim and Andrea Romano so those those are cool right 
All right. So honestly, not really too many or any <laughs> big news and discussion topics that happened since our last episode on the Batman comics front, really, at least anything that's, you know, interesting to me. <laughs> I know the one thing that came out this week was the first trailer for Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans, the animated movie that was teased at the end of Teen Titans Go to the movies, which I still want to see. I know it's on HBO and I got to want to stream it and watch it because I've heard nothing but great things about it. So, but I did watch the trailer for the Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans. It looks like a fun little romp, but it was kind of cool to see the classic Teen Titans designs, you know, in HD (laughs) and looking, the quality looking better than ever before. So it'd probably be a fun, uh, you know, team up slash versus versus movie between the two different versions and i'm sure a lot of good dc crossovers multiverse jokes are going to be <laughs> at the forefront of that movie so probably something worth checking out but i still got to see teen times go to the movies so i guess other than that might as well just get into our comic book reviews for this episode and for this one we're going to be reviewing detective comics number 1006 and batman number 73 and as always Got to throw out the spoiler warnings for these issues as it will be going into detail as far as what happens in both of them. So if you haven't read them yet, might want to hold off, uh, read them, then hear what I think about both these issues. So, um, And as always, got to have a rating scale. And for this one, I don't know, Dane, I was thinking fast food restaurant chains that uh, will become baseball stadium names in the future. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> you got Wendy's, you got McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, KFC. As I was, as we were uh, talking about it, I was just yeah. thinking, you know, this is probably going to make a good rating scale for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first up is Detective Comics number 1006. This is starting a new story arc after, unfortunately, I got to say the disappointing Arkham Knight arc that, came out of Detective Comics after issue 1000. I was excited for it to see the Arkham Knight be brought into the main comics continuity. At first, I thought it started out okay. I was happy it was a new character introduced. It wasn't Jason Todd like it was in the video game. And uh, this one, it got to uh, her origin story. Uh, it lost me there. And then <laughs> the issue, which we didn't review on the last our last episode, but it was the final issue of that story arc. It didn't end any better, in my opinion. This is kind of really anticlimactic. She gets, she tries to blind everyone in Gotham, including Batman. So Batman was blind for a little bit. And, you know, they stop her, reverse the effects, and then she gets captured, but then gets freed on her way to Arkham. So I'm sure she'll show up again. Maybe she'll have a better story arc next time, but that one was a little disappointing. So, but this new arc has to deal with the Spectre. And this one, uh, I hate to say it, but because I'm a big fan of Peter Tomasi and what he's done with Batman. But ever since Batman 1000, because his first arc leading up to Batman 1000 or Detective Comics 1000, I should say, was really great. But everything since then, it's, uh, I haven't been a fan of, to be honest with you. And this new one with the Spectre didn't get off to a great start, in my opinion. And just, you know, maybe not necessarily anything bad, but I'm just not really interested in the story. I mean, it is a murder mystery that, you know, fitting with the name detective comics but we've seen a lot of with batman trying to do and this one didn't really grab me in any unique way it starts up with these two detectives um investigating a dead body in an alley and then they get attacked by this this group of cult like a cult group that are dressed up as the specter um saying things like the host must die long live the host that's all they keep saying and they end up killing one of the detectives and i'm not familiar with who the current host of the specter is in the comics now i haven't <laughs> really read too many stories with the specter in a while but apparently it is one of these uh detectives who was investigating this murder and the specter leaves its host to, to attack um one of these cult members that's dressed like him and when that happens um his host body gets captured by the remaining members and the specter is left alone you know wondering what to do so who does he want to help him with this case it's batman (laughs) and we do get a pretty fun sequence i do say with some cool art to get batman's attention the specter just makes himself a giant and he's just walking through gotham city as this big you know uh visceral figure you know of this big apparition in the city that gets batman attention and he speaks to him you know just calling for batman the art in this was really good i will have to say so i did enjoy that aspect uh, of the issue but story-wise nothing that really stood out to me or just grabbed my attention or made me excited for what's to come so you know batman goes with him he takes specter takes him to the crime scene 
Batman realizes that the Spectre murdered one of those cult members in brutal, you know, fashion. Like Batman just calls this like, you know, it's savage, it's a slaughter, and the Spectre's calling it justice. So he's using Batman's help to find his host body and have Batman kind of put together the clues as the world's greatest detective to see where they might have taken him. And that's kind of basically where uh, the story ends. Batman and the Spectre aren't getting along. Uh, Batman says, you know, he will solve the murder, but he's going to do it without the kind of bloodshed that the Spectre brings. And the Spectre, you know, as long as he's able to find his host body, uh, that's all he cares about. So um, once Batman, because it was kind of cool where the Spectre was showing Batman the crime scene, Gordon's there, the police team was there, the forensics was there, but they weren't, they couldn't see Batman and the Spectre. But once the Spectre leaves, Batman just shows up, (laughs) just pops up out of nowhere and Gordon uh, sees him and Batman takes him some evidence. So um, the issue ends just with those cult uh, members having uh, the host body of the Spectre, you know, lying on a table, look like to perform some sacrificial ceremony or something. So we'll see what happens. But right off the bat, with this issue kicking off the story arc, I'm not too excited about where it's going. So I'm just going to give it two, two and a half out of five fast food chains that will soon become uh, baseball stadium names. So not too many <laughs> with this issue. <laughs> That's not enough baseball stadiums, Tim. No. So Batman number uh, 73 is going to have its work cut out for it if it want more fast food chains. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, it does. So <laughs> I enjoyed this issue quite a bit more so than I did Detective Comics 1006. And this is uh, Tom King doing something, again, unique in his art that has a lot of unique issues in it. But I really enjoyed this one. Uh, both visually and from a story standpoint. And visually, it looks like he, uh, um, the artist who, again, is it Mikhail Yannin? I always probably <laughs> mispronounce uh, the artist's name here when we're talking about it, even though I give it a lot, a lot of praise, so I probably should get familiar with pronouncing the name. But the artwork is good in here, and it's taking a page from, you know, you cannot help but think about the nightmare sequence in Batman versus Superman because we're following Thomas Wayne Batman in the desert, you know, with the trench coat, the goggles, the scarf, this kind of like outfit Ben Affleck had in Batman versus Superman during uh, the nightmare sequence. And it looks really cool uh, in the comics page. And it's, you know, with the red eyes too uh, that uh, the Thomas Wayne version of the Batman has in his lenses, it looks for a unique look as well. That goes good <laughs> with that kind of design for Batman. So uh, the last issue left off with Bane kind of breaking Batman again, though we didn't know what happened to him. And Thomas Wayne just saying, how can he help Bane uh, do what he needs to do? And now Thomas Wayne, we're seeing what he's doing to help. And this finally answers his motivation to why he's working with Bane. I was curious if, you know, one of my big big questions about that, will it be satisfying to what was established in the Button story arc that I love so much? And why Thomas Wayne could say what he said there and do the things that he's doing with Bane to Bruce. You know, there's got to be a connection. And I think it's one that works really well and it makes sense. So the issue is basically just Bruce and Thomas Wayne in the desert. He's Thomas Wayne's on horseback. Uh, Bruce is unconscious and he's dragging a coffin with him behind the horse. And he ends up like throughout the course of the issue, he's singing this, these songs. One of them is home on the range (laughs) as he's fighting these ninja assassins that he, that kind of ambush him along the way twice as they're making their way across the desert. But he's able to take them down pretty easily while singing Home on the Range, <laughs> which I would love to see animated someday. You know, a Batman fighting these ninjas while singing a song like Home on the Range. It's got to make for a <laughs> unique sequence to see play out in animation or, hey, maybe even live action someday. But some of my favorite moments uh, from the issue have to do when Bruce wakes up and he has conversations with his father. And we get explanations as far as, you know, Thomas Wayne healing him up. Uh, repairing his spine you know, it looks like he might have done the dark knight rises approach <laughs> with that rope but they don't show it he just says that he nursed bruce back to health or back to health and bruce even asks him you know why are you doing the things you, you or why do you allow bane to do the things he did to me and you know just stand there I, like he even says i saw you you were just standing there as i was being beaten by bane so i like that bruce was kind of calling him out on what he was doing and in his own way thomas wayne is viewing this as the best thing for bruce and kind of showing his love for him and he even tells him you were defeated you were broken in both body and soul but that's over now 
you know, Gotham's behind you. That life is behind you. It's time to rebuild and to show how strong you really are. And just the words, because I was a little worried that in the button story arc, everything that Tom Thomas Wayne said to Bruce there was, you know, just an act and he didn't really mean it. But in this issue, that's not the case. You just see the love that he has for Bruce and that he has his son again after thinking he lost him. Just calling him, you know, you know, my little boy, you don't have to worry anymore about anything. And just giving him a hug and saying, your father's got you. I mean, just how important that must be for both Thomas Wayne and Bruce, uh, two characters who thought they'd never see, you know, Bruce seeing his parents again and Thomas Wayne from the Flashpoint universe never seeing his son again. So this is a great father-son moment that reminded me of why or the stuff I love so much in the button story arc. It was just great to see that again in this issue. So, and and then Bruce asks him, you know, is this a dream? And Thomas says, yes, son, but not yours. I was worried. Oh no, is this another hallucination or dream sequence we're getting after all those issues of Batman being in these different dreams? But apparently it's not a literal dream. It's just a dream that Thomas Wayne has that he's bringing to fruition. And this is, you know, where things get a little interesting as far as what Thomas Wayne's goal is here. And because it's all about, you know, he wanted Bruce to leave the life of Batman behind. He didn't want that for his son in the button. And now he's saying this is his opportunity to do that. And Bruce kind of puts two and two together. Why, why they're in the desert, these ninjas that are attacking them, they are the death of the desert ninjas. They're Rachel Gould's personal guard. And the reason they keep ambushing Thomas Wayne and Bruce is because they don't want him reaching um, this different type of Lazarus pit called uh, the Nine Pit, and that's where Thomas Wayne is trying to get to. And it's something that you know just doesn't you know, restore you if you're injured or hurt. It can revive you from death. And once Bruce figures that out, Thomas Wayne goes, "You know, I'm I'm proud of you, son." And then when Bruce realizes who's in the coffin, that's where things get really interesting. And I really can't wait to see where it goes because it's revealed it's Martha Wayne in that coffin. So. Thomas Wayne is pretty much just trying to bring his family back. You know, he wanted without the burden of Batman for Batman or for Bruce, I should say, or himself. And then to bring Martha back from the dead. Um, So I wasn't expecting that (laughs) to be Thomas Wayne's ultimate end goal end goal in working with Bane. But it's a story point that I'm definitely interested and curious to see how it's going to play out. And if I'm going to be, totally honest i mean this might sound you know sacrilegious to bat- other batman fans but you know it's been 80 years since the character was introduced to the comics we know his story his parents were murdered but i'm i'm all for bringing martha wayne back now that thomas wayne is back i mean i'm sure it won't last but let's see what happens how bruce reacts to having his parents back from the dead in a way we've never seen before in the main continuity type storyline in Batman comics. And I want to see that play out. I mean, why not? It'll be something different. Like I said, after 80 years, let's get a story like that where Bruce as Batman is alive or is, I should say his parents are alive with Bruce as Batman. That's not a dream, a parallel universe, or, you know, he's not under control by the Mad Hatter, (laughs) anything like that, or he's, it's actually his real life and his parents are there. Let's see a story of how Bruce would react to that and how things will change. Uh, in his life because his parents are alive. Will he still be Batman? Will he decide to give that all up like Thomas Wayne wants and the whole purpose of him working with Bane to break his both body and soul. So will Bruce adhere to that now that his parents are both alive? So, I mean, I, right now I'm hoping they succeed in their mission. It doesn't come to a point where it looks like they're closed, but then Tom King decides not to go that far because he just can't bring both Thomas and Martha Wayne back in the main continuity. But I'm sure they could figure out a way to where they come back. And again, I don't think it'll last forever. So there'll be something that where they won't be around with Bruce uh, as Batman. They'll they'll either die or, you know, something will happen. (laughs) A new timeline change. Maybe Doomsday Clock will reset things after that ends with Dr. Manhattan. Some way, somehow, I'm sure there'll be retcon where they're not around anymore. But just for a little bit. Let's get a few issues in a story arc where both Thomas and Martha Wayne are around for Bruce as he's Batman. So I say bring it on. (laughs) That's uh, my thinking right now. I think even Tom King has has teased in some tweets how stuff that's going to happen in future issues will change, you know, the course of Batman's history forever. And I can't think of something much bigger than bringing both his parents back um, fitting that description. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, The issue. I was saying how a dream story arc and 
Uh, that was a confrontation with Bane. I was hoping things kind of pick up the pace a little bit. Let's get some, you know, more elements of the story going as far as what the end game is. And I think we got that in this issue as far, at least for Thomas Wayne and his motivations for everything. So then the issue ends in a cool way where once Bruce figures everything out, what they're doing, he just looks at Thomas and he goes, where is it? And Thomas Wayne goes to Saddlebag. Not saying what it is. Thomas knows exactly what he's talking about. Bruce opens the bag and it's the cowl. And we see them both riding out <laughs> with their cowls on and it looks awesome. So uh, really like this issue. Really like where things are going um, in Tom King's story before his arc ends later at the end of this year. So I think this is some good uh, momentum that was built with this issue that I was looking for and haven't felt for a while now in his run. So I'm excited where things are going and just curious to see how it's going to play out. So I'm going to give our Batman number 73 four out of five fast food restaurants that will soon become baseball stadium names. So we got a good amount to look forward to now, Dane, thanks to this issue. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to do it for this episode. Kind of a shorter one with not uh, too much uh, news to go about, but still some fun discussions to be had about celebrating the 30th anniversary of Batman 1989 and just some fun baseball discussions about <laughs> fast food restaurants and baseball stadiums. I should say, Dane, when we started the episode, uh, the score was tied 6-6 for the Yankees-Red Sox London game. You want to know what it yeah. is now? What is it? 17-7 Yankees. What? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uh, the Yankees went on a tear. I think it was the fourth or fifth inning. A lot of home runs. Judge hit a home run. Uh, DJ LeMay, you hit a bases clearing uh, double with the bases loaded. So <laughs> they had another huge inning. Well, they scored six in the fourth. Yeah, that was at the fourth. Yeah, seventeen <laughs> seven. Wow. I have a feeling that's not going to be the final score by the time we get to the ninth inning and the game's over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. This game's probably going to be five hours long too. <laughs> so the fans of London are definitely getting their money's worth. So yes, they are. Hope they're enjoying wow. it. <laughs> But with that, I will throw it to you, Dane, for the outro, as always. All right, just go to BatmanUniverse.net, Facebook.com slash BatmanUniverse, Twitter handles at BatmanUniverse, show's Twitter handles at Batman's Podcast, Tim's Twitter handles at TimG311, and my Twitter handles at Dane since been out. Email the show at BatfansWithoutPants at gmail.com, and rate and review us on iTunes. So with that, like we say at the end of every single episode, Tim. We love each and every one of you with all of our bat and fast food hearts. That's who we are. See you guys next time. See you, everybody. Bye.